The Highlands Community Association used to publish its newsletter using a typewriter and a copy machine. And it looked it. Nowadays, they're using an Apple Macintosh, a laser writer, and their newsletter looks a lot better. Indeed, nowadays, organizations from PTAs to Fortune 500 companies are turning to desktop publishing. And today, we're going to begin a special two-part look at desktop publishing on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible by Leading Edge, makers of IBM-compatible computer systems, including Lotus Lookalike Spreadsheet, word processing with spelling correction, communication software, and Hayes-compatible 1200 baud modem. Leading Edge, with over 1,000 service centers nationwide. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, this is not the most earth-shattering example of desktop publishing, but a pretty interesting one nevertheless, showing how you can take complex graphics, merge them with text, and if you have a laser printer, come up with some pretty spiffy-looking output like that. We're looking at this software package called ComicWorks on a Macintosh, and of course many people say it was desktop publishing that made or perhaps even saved the Mac. Well, Stuart, you know, at IBM PC come standard with character-only display, and it's only been recently that we've moved toward the CGA and EGA mm -hmm. standards. But for desktop publishing, you really have to have high-resolution display. Monochrome is okay. You don't really need to have color. Mm -hmm. You take the Mac, it's got a mouse. You can point at a picture, move it around. It makes it really ideal for desktop publishing. Gary, today we're going to take a look at the Macintosh side of desktop publishing. We'll see the newest version of one of the major software packages for doing publishing on the Mac. Ready, set, go. We'll learn everything you ever wanted to know about fonts. We'll see an 8.5 by 11-inch display for the Mac, just right for publishing applications. And we'll meet the man who more or less created the field with a product called PageMaker. One effect of desktop publishing has been the creation of a whole new cottage industry. And we're going to start out today by taking a look at one DTP entrepreneur in Oakland, California. The successful wedding of computers, lasers, and printers is on the verge of transforming traditional publishing and printing at every level. For the small business, desktop publishing means having near total control over the design and printing of small documents. At Highlights Electronic Publishing Company in Oakland, California, George Poor combines electronic communications with desktop printing to provide a complete, self-contained newsletter publishing service. His clients span the globe from a local nursing association to trans-Pacific teleconferences. Desktop publishing has created a new category of printing professionals. George can take an unproofed memo from halfway around the world strip off the original formatting and clean up the document like an ordinary word processing job. Next, using a page composition program like PageMaker, he composes the layout of the document from text to titles to graphics, all on his Macintosh. The final step is the printing, usually done on the spot with a laser writer. While the impact of electronic publishing has just begun in the professional world, it's easy to see its appeal to individual publishers. It's relatively inexpensive and fast. It uses common hardware. The print quality, while not yet up to photo typesetting, is fine for smaller jobs. But best of all, desktop publishing puts the power of the printed word within the reach of everyone. Joining us now is Michael Chung, the Vice President of Marketing for Manhattan Graphics. And next to Michael is Richard Ware, a graphic artist from Carmel, California, who specializes in designing fonts. Michael, uh, desktop publishing appears it's going to be a brand new application area. It could be a very big one. What does desktop publishing offer the average Mac customer? Well, I think it's significant in that it offers a significant cost savings. And uh, something that was heretofore not quantifiable using conventional software such as spreadsheets and databases. But there are real studies that show 
that people can save as much as 50 percent. And so what are they actually using it for? They're using it for a variety of documents. Uh, newsletters have been the most traditional mm -hmm. application, but I think that's going to change rapidly as people see how uh, effective it can be in even standard day-to-day -day documentation such as memos and letters, etc. Uh -huh. When okay. you say cost saving, mm -hmm. Michael, you mean compared to taking it out of house to do the same kinds of things? Correct, correct. Uh, there's obviously two parts of the story. Uh, traditional documents that may have been produced that way, that's where the most of the cost savings can be realized. But now you see a lot of people starting to produce documents that otherwise would have just been typewritten. Okay, now you have a product called Ready, Set, Go. Uh, can you show us how that works? Sure. In essence, you are looking at a full page here, and uh, the first thing you need to do is cr create a text block, and you can do that by either uh, resizing using the text tool. And uh, you have a freeform design that allows you to create and put your pictures anywhere you like. So text is brought in by either typing. Uh, for this particular uh, demonstration, I will just get text because it's simply simpler. You were building columns there? Uh, I was building and, some columns and, and, I, and I'm placing some graphics okay. right now at this point. And uh, you can see here where this is filling in the, I don't it's filling in the text. Okay, now so now the text. you have a second column here, and I am going to link these two columns quickly. And the text will automatically flow into mm -hmm. the second column. Now, what you can do is you can save an enormous amount of time by calling in a Snap2 grid system, for example that allows you to resize the whole thing and actually accurately place all of the items on a page. So I can just resize this particular text block and it automatically reflows and then I can uh, make this one a bit smaller. So you can set your grid first or then come in after you put in yeah, the text. Yeah, either way you, you have uh, complete flexibility. And now I'm going to add a picture up here um, which just by resizing this uh, you get a nice little picture. And uh, this is typically the uh, most popular application, adding uh, some kind of graphic mm -hmm. to your uh, chart. And then with this particular tool, you can just position your graphic vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis the rest of okay, your document. Can you get a close-up view of some of the text sure. here? Sure. Mm -hmm. If you move into the actual size mode, you can see what your text looks like. What I can do here is I can uh, change the font size real quickly to something that is probably a little bit more visible. And, uh, and you can go ahead and add text there. You can add the, text at any text. point in time, and it will automatically ripple. Okay, so what you did there was pull up an existing text file, right. or you could actually run it as if it were word processor. Mm -hmm. and correct, text correct. And you have a view, and there are various views that you can see your document. Michael, this is Ready, Set, Go 3. Mm -hmm. uh, you had one of the earliest uh, desktop publishing products for the Mac. What's new about Ready, Set, Go 3? Well, we produced uh, a product that initially didn't have the typographic features that everybody wanted. And now in Ready, Set, Go 3, you have kerning, hyphenation. You have the ability to for do... For people who don't know, what is kerning? Kerning is simply the ability to move letters closer together. For example, if you have a T and a Y, the Y is tucked under the T. Mm -hmm. and that's a very specific application of kerning. Hyphenation means simply breaking the right. words with the correct mm -hmm. hyphen. And those are the typical, some of the more powerful features. Could, that could you have. show us the, the end result? We've got a laser writer behind you there. And, sure. and what would the output look like? This is one of a sample that would have been created given a little more time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, certainly not much more effort. I want to I wanna get to Fonts and Richard mm -hmm. now. If you can get mm -hmm. out of uh, your sure. program and we can get to uh, something called Fontographer. Uh, while we're getting ready here, Richard, what? Why are fonts important? I mean, why, why do you have to have this choice of all these different fonts if you're doing this kind of work? Well, it helps communicate a little bit more than just the words. It communicates the feeling or gives particular words more impact, uh, communicates uh, a formal feeling or an informal feeling, uh, many things like that. Now, you're a user, really, and a designer of fonts, mm -hmm. and you're working with a program called Fontographer, and I want you to show us how, as an artist, you can create a new font using a piece of software like that. Okay. It'll be up in just a okay. moment. And with Fontographer, you create uh, the outline of the font, uh, the outline description, which is then turned into the postscript uh, printer language. Mm -hmm. And then this outline of each character can be scaled to any size. So you're really making custom fonts here, not buying an existing font package. We're, I'm making uh, the fonts from the from the ground up, yes. And then we sell the okay. packages. Sh show us what you're doing. So let's look at the character here. Well, first, this main grid shows all the possible character locations. You can put whatever actually you want in them. 
And, and this is some just sort of stock starting generic font of some sort? This is, uh, this is the system font. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's uh, built into the Macintosh. <clears throat> and it covers a uh, fairly complete character set. There are more diacritical characters okay, and so you pulled, say, there. a B out of that. So image. this B has the three different types of points which, which you use to create the paths. You can zoom in. There are about four levels of uh, zoom in Photographer. This is a corner point for obvious reasons. This is a tangent point where you're going from a straight line into a curve. To make it clear, you zo you're zoomed in real tight on the B right now. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the top curve of the B, okay. There you go. And then the tangent going into a curve, here's a curve point, and each point has a pair of Bezier control points which can alter the character of the curve very easily and in many different ways. It's a very flexible drawing tool, basically. Uh, Richard, what do you look for when you're designing a font? How do you make it all look the same, <laughs> same well, style? Give a consistent look. When you see a whole page of text, you, want, you don't want to have part of it looking heavy in part mm -hmm. too so light. So it really is an art form. Oh, yes, yeah. and uh, it has lots of tradition behind it, which uh, within which it's amazingly uh, possible to be creative. And Richard, once you've designed your, your B for now, for example, you could print it out and see what that would look like. Right? Certainly. And I think we have one there have... in the laser writer. Michael, if you could grab it and we could... Yeah. Okay, so that's one B that you had, uh, you had designed there. Okay, we're going to have to move along, gentlemen. Thank you very much. In just a minute, we're going to take a look at a large display monitor for the Mac, and we'll find out how to get some artwork into your documents, so stay with us. Joining us now in the studio is Michael Boych, the president of Radius Incorporated, and sitting next to Michael is Randy Kincaid, manager of desktop publishing for Dynamic Graphics, Inc. Stuart, Michael has a great product for those of us who don't have 20-20 vision, <laughs> <laughs> so it makes that little Mac screen a whole lot bigger. But uh, basically, Michael, uh, what you've done here is a full-page display, I believe, that connects up to the Mac. That's uh, right. Okay. Could you show us how this thing works? Certainly. Uh, in fact, to... Oh, by the way, let's, let's mention there's a little flicker here, I think, that the viewers might see. Could you explain that away? That's right. In our, we, we really dislike flicker at Radius, uh -huh. and in fact, we went to great pains to uh, increase the, the refresh rate of the screen, that is, the number of times the entire screen is drawn from 60 to 67. Mm -hmm. Which makes it flicker to the viewer at home, but it's not flickering here. That, that's here. right. Television, I guess, is geared yeah. to displaying 60 okay, to 67. So. Let's take a look at how this works. Okay. Well, we're in a uh, word processor called Right Now that I've chosen to demo our hardware with. And uh, to begin things, I've actually got a Right Now document on the Macintosh display. Mm -hmm. So this is, in fact, what a typical Macintosh user will see. Which is a piece of a page. That's right. right. It's mm -hmm. about uh, a little over a third of a page, in fact. And I can open another copy of this document onto the radius display, and that'll give us a little idea of uh, how much more perspective you get. So we'll load that from disk. And there's the same oh, yeah. document, only you can see all of it. Right. It's an 8 and a half by 11 format. We're seeing exa right, exactly an 8 and a half by 11 page here. If I scroll even a pixel or two, I see the, the page break mm -hmm. at the bottom. Now, what is the resolution of the radius display? Uh, the resolution in, in dots per inch is mm -hmm. identical to the Macintosh, okay. which is why things appear the same. In total pixels, we're 640 across and 864 And vertical. how does that compare with the Mac? The Mac is 512 horizontally and 342 Okay, so vertical. you got quite a more detail here in this We're one. about mm -hmm. triple the total area. Okay. Now, ideally, you're really working with both screens when you use this application. Show us an example of how you really take advantage of both the screens. Sure. That was an important uh, engineering thought to us, was people have already paid for the Mac screen. We didn't really want to put it to sleep and have only the large screen. So as I move the cursor across uh, the display, I see it go right from the radius display onto the Mac display. In fact, I can... Uh, Did you do up. that move again? <laughs> That's pretty <Sure>. impressive. <laughs> Actually, we'll make the cursor large, which is another of our little hidden features. Mm -hmm. And as I move the cursor across now, I see this is just one contiguous mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. In fact, I can take a window and uh, span it halfway across the two displays if I choose to. Let's put it back where it belongs, though. A, a more typical use is that I'll be editing my, my 8.5 by 11 document, and I'll want to get out one of the Macintosh desk accessories, say the uh, scrapbook. I can bring the scrapbook down and have it go right onto the Mac display. So again, if I have additional tools or palettes in an application, 
I can allow those to reside on the Mac display and see an 8.5 by 11 document unobstructed on the radius display. That's so this good. is really definitely what you see is what you get. That's right. <laughs> For real. That's right. Yeah. right. Okay. Mike, if you could uh, reconfigure there, because we want to get Randy's uh, program up here in just a second. Randy, mm -hmm. let me ask you, we've been talking about text here, and your bit is to help people get graphics of various sorts in there. Tell me a little bit about what desktop art does. And desktop art is art for everyone who's not an illustrator. It's the work of professional illustrators that we have stored on software. So no matter what your project is, we have an illustration that probably fits it. Uh, instead of buying a big paper volume of art that you have to take scissors and stab yourself with, uh, <laughs> you've got a small disk. Okay, so you're you can a plug library in. of professional graphics right. on a disk. Okay, show us how you would use that. Okay. What we're looking at here is a standard Mac Paint window. Some of our illustrations are stored as Mac Paint, some as Full Paint, some as Mac Draw. I've closed the window. I'm going to choose Open, and there's a desktop art disk in one of the drives. And what you're seeing here are page numbers that correspond to a pictorial index. Mm -hmm. You choose the illustration you want, and we have previously decided on page 21, and there's a very pretty teacher sitting there. Now, Randy, uh, how would that be brought into a document of some sort? All of the page composition software for the Macintosh is able to import Mac Paint and Mac mm -hmm. Draw if it's saved as a picked file. So in PageMaker, Letter Page, Ready, Set, and Go, and all the other page composition softwares, they have place or import. You choose that, choose the document that has the illustration, and with a, pressing a couple of buttons, it's right there with all your oh, words. Wow. Yeah. Okay, Randy, in this particular case, this is a, a paint image. And uh, what if you want to do some scaling or make it you know, uh, smaller in some dimension? Is it a difficulty with paint? M it is, because it's bit mapped and it mm -hmm. rearranges it. Uh, many of the page composition Page composition software does some scaling very nicely, though. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you have an example of uh, some draw image, is that true? Right. Okay, let's take a look at this. Yeah, so you can manipulate uh, one of your graphics and change it? Yes. In desktop art? You can invert it, turn the black areas mm -hmm. white, the white mm -hmm. areas black. You can flop it. If the woman was facing right, you could change it so she faced left according to what your project needs were. What are you going to pull up now for us then? I've opened a blank McDraw window now to show you some of the McDraw art that we have. And this was recreated by Illustration sitting at the Macintosh looking at an original illustration. Okay, now once again, you're pulling up a graphic from your basic library, which you could have picked up by looking at the, at right. the, at the brochure mm -hmm. there. Okay, and there There's it is. There's a particular page. And we're looking at a fit to window. I'll bring this up. normal size so that we can see it mm -hmm. and we can move around and simply look for the illustration that we want let's say your project was producing a bookmark for a school district and you wanted to work with this girl reading a book right here we've chosen it I can copy it it's just like cutting it out of a page mm -hmm. open a new page and paste it down all without scissors and paste pot. If I wanted to change this to a boy, you have some flexibility in being creative. We encourage people to be creative. Don't just use these the way they appear. Play with them. See what you can do with your own, own creativity and imagination. This, this is good software. You're going to turn her into a boy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, what I'm doing now is breaking this down into the in individual items that it was originally created with. And mm -hmm. turning her into a boy can be as easy as removing the pigtails. Okay, you did it. Mm -hmm. we're, we're out of time here. Thank you very much, Randy and Mike. In just a minute, we'll meet the man behind PageMaker. And we'll also, first of all, take a look at a major corporation that uses desktop publishing and PageMaker. Wendy Woods has that report. The biggest test of desktop publishing is taking place in corporate America, places like Chevron Corporation in San Ramon, California. Here, the Personal Computing Services Center is using a small network of Macintoshes running PageMaker, a laser writer, and a PCAT as a file server. With this setup, they put together PACER, a newsletter about personal computing which goes to 3,500 Chevron employees. One year ago, PACER was still being made with a mainframe editor without the benefit of versatile fonts and graphics of the laser writer. The process used to take six to eight weeks. When desktop publishing came about, we were able to finally merge text and graphics and explain some very complicated technical issues to our readers 
in a much clearer way. So we found that our readership increased. We also found that the turnaround time for the document was much faster. We could put out a draft copy, get the changes back, edit them, and get the newsletter out in the one month lead time that we had. This desktop publishing system has given the staff more control over their finished product and plenty of praise concerning its format and style. The Personal Computing Services Center has been desktop publishing for only about a year now, but already it's termed an overwhelming success, so much so that people from within Chevron and from other Fortune 500 companies have been calling here asking for help setting up their own system. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. And with us now in the studio is Paul Brainer, the president of Aldous Corporation, the man who invented the word desktop publishing, and the guy who also brought us the product page maker. Gary, Paul, the uh, the uh, we talk about the early days of desktop pub desktop publishing. How far back does it really go? Well, we're not talking too long ago. We're okay. really talking a year to 18 months before the concept of desktop publishing took hold. Yeah, what was really the beginnings of desktop publishing? Well, my background, as you may know, is in the publishing business. I have a background in newspapers, and I was an editor, and I'm a journalist by training. And what we saw, what I saw in our company, was that we could create, take a microcomputer and laser printing technology and combine it with software like PageMaker mm -hmm. and be able to produce a solution for people that wouldn't have had access to these tools before, to produce high-quality print, printed communication in the office. Do you think that uh, desktop publishing is really a replacement for, uh, let's say, manual typesetting, or is it is it really a replacement for a typewriter? <laughs> well, it's both, and that's the interesting thing. It really expands both ends of it. When I define desktop publishing, it's where you want a more professional-looking result than what your word processor can give you, per perhaps short of what you'd need to produce a book, a newspaper, or a magazine, but it's everything in between, and it turns out there's a whole lot of things mm -hmm. in between those two extremes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think uh, at, the, at the recent desktop publishing conference, I guess it was Steve Jobs who said this is an industry which will cease to exist because it's just simply going to become one big fancy word processor. Do you think that'll happen? Not necessarily. I think in the long term, yes, that word processing will fully integrate text and graphics and that'll become the expectation of everyone that uses computers as tools, but there's going to be a wide range of products that suit different people's needs and not everyone needs to integrate text and graphics. Well, what's, what's missing in current uh, desktop publishing packages? What are people asking for? They're asking for lots of things. We put together a list the other day of our end user requests, and there were 270 requests on the list. <laughs> the, they want more typographic capabilities, things like hyphenation support, uh, kerning, which is moving characters close mm -hmm. together, um, greater number of pages, longer technical manuals, larger paper sizes, you name it, they okay. want it. <laughs> Paul, you have put new features into a new release of PageMaker. Yes. What have you added? How is it better? The our Macintosh 2.0 version covers just some of those exact things. Automatic hyphenation, greater typographic quality, and larger document support, mm -hmm. along with about 15 other features. Paul, thank you very much. And we're going to see you again next week as we take a look at desktop publishing in the world of MS-DOS. So make sure you join us again. Right now, we'll be back in just a minute with this week's computer news. In the random access file this week, bulletin board users are starting to take action against cracked hackers who are planting Trojan horse software on bulletin boards. The Trojan programs claim to do one thing, but end up destroying files or, in some cases, stealing passwords. Several bulletin boards around the country are now running a list of what's being called the Dirty Dozen well-known Trojan horse programs. These programs may carry a variety of file extensions, so be on the lookout for these potentially destructive freebies. Lotus has announced a new super-powerful word processor called Manuscript. It was written by Jonathan Sachs, author of 123. One reviewer says Manuscript sets new standards for speed and power in a word processor. IBM is taking another step in the desktop publishing arena, introducing its own brand of DTP software for the RTPC. It's called RT Publishing Software, and it has the usual publishing features, plus the ability to size, rotate, and annotate CAD drawings. Hayes has announced a new version of the Smart Modem and SmartCom 2 for the IBM PC convertible. The Smart Modem 1200C is designed for low power consumption, and SmartCom 2 will be on a 3.5-inch disk. 
The online service, The Source, may be for sale. The Source's owner, The Reader's Digest, has hired an investment banker reportedly to look into the market value of The Source. Owners say The Source turned a profit for the first time last year. Time for this week's software review, and here's our reviewer, Paul Schindler. Telephones ring when someone's trying to reach you. Electronic mail doesn't disturb your concentration, but you never know if there's a message waiting for you until you remember to call your electronic mail service. A new program called Get solves this problem by checking your email services automatically, and it does this even when you're working some other job. You start this process by adding your identification codes and passwords to the predefined services that Get includes, popular networks like MCI Mail, The Source, EasyLink, and seven others. Then you tell Get to call these services at specific times or periodically, like every two hours. Get dials the service, makes inquiries about pending messages, and signs off, leaving the results of each call in a file that you access by hitting two keys. You can then log into that file and pick up your mail. At less than $90, this is an amazing bargain in state-of-the-art telecommunication software. Get is offered by Signet Technologies of Sunnyvale, California. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. There's more coming out of Hungary these days than Rubik's Cubes. Major computer makers like IBM, Commodore, and Sony are buying software from the communist country. Hungarian software developers have a good reputation, and they say there is no market for their software in other socialist countries. Most communist countries have yet to build their first personal computer, and even those on the drawing boards are 8-bit models with 64K limits. Computer software may soon replace the farmer's almanac as the key to knowing what will work in the coming growing season. Two new software programs for farmers called Gossam and Comax have been tested with a group of Mississippi farmers. The programs measure variables such as weather conditions and plant growth to recommend best times for planting, fertilizing, and harvesting. In one experiment, a cotton farmer using the software was able to double the output of his acreage compared to farmers who did not use the software. Did you ever stand in endless lines registering for college classes? That will be a thing of the past this spring at Texas A&M. The university will be using the first ever online class registration system. You don't even need a computer. A student can register for classes simply by using a touch-tone phone and punching in the appropriate class code numbers. Last week marked the 40th anniversary of the development of one of the milestones in computer history, the ENIAC computer at the University of Pennsylvania. It was developed in 1946 and it weighed 30 tons and filled a 30 by 50 foot room. One of the original inventors of the ENIAC said, it was my whole life's work and now it's all been put on one square centimeter of silicon. That's it for this week's Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible by Leading Edge, makers of IBM-compatible computer systems, including Lotus Lookalike Spreadsheet, word processing with spelling correction, communication software, and Hayes-compatible 1200 baud modem. Leading Edge, with over 1,000 service centers nationwide. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide.